Okay, so I think we can we can start. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for staying for today's talk. Uh, today I'm here to talk about OSPOS in finance. Uh, but before starting, uh, I'm here to say that I'm not an expert in uh, finance services. I'm here to talk about uh, what I've learned uh, and give some remarks of the experience that some uh, people in the Tudor community that are OSPO leaders around different sectors, including OSPOs in finance, have been sharing uh, uh, across uh, within these years. Um, so, first of all, I will give you some context of well, what, what's building an OSPO in finance and some of the challenges uh, some of these OSPOs have been facing so far. Uh, then I will be talking about OSPOs and what it really is an OSPO and the main character, what characterizes an OSPO. Uh, then we, I would like to share some financial organizations that already have an OSPO and are engaging in Tudu and in other organizations such as uh, Finals. And finally, uh, the main goal of this is also to bring an open discussions on how can we collaborate both finals and to the group to help more OSPOs in this sector to be created and also help the existing ones to advance. Um, so I will start with some open source context. Uh, many of you already will know that open source has one, and uh, this is from uh, the last Open SSF um, conference in Open Source Summit, uh, where they share this uh, data of like 90% of modern applications using source code, and it's very likely that in your organization, even though you're not um, contributing to open source, at some point you're using or your engineers are using open source. Uh, so if you're using open source, it's also people are starting to realize that it's time to give back and not only using, because if you ignore that part, vulnerabilities and risks uh, can come of taking of just using and not taking care of, of the open source. Um, so from the finance perspective, uh, there's been some restrictions and uh, sometimes some barriers uh, from people to actually get into open source and get into an OSPO that I will later, later explain better. Uh, and has uh, also be directly affected to the ability to execute, to uh, advance in the open source journey. Most more of those are regulators, organizational culture of the finance and services and technology trends. Um, and broadly speaking, the three main goals that I've been hearing across all these financial uh, systems with, a, with an OSPO has been we need awareness, we need to realize the benefits of open source code and collaboration, uh, we need to enable open source contributions rather than consumption, and we need enable safe and compliant open source collaboration. And I've highlighted safe and compliant because that is uh, one of the main focus of uh, the financial OSPOs, legal driven states. And then from that, once they have that, move into more community driven states. Um, so for that, for starting the open source journey, I wanted to also to highlight the work that finals are doing in the uh, open source readiness project. I think they have great resources on how to invite organizations to start taking care of uh, the open source projects and the open source efforts they're doing. So uh, they have an open source policies uh, focused on the financial systems. Uh, they have an open source maturity model. They have a working group to discuss about the status of open source and financial systems. I think those are really great um, resources to get it started and to actually understand the value of open source for an organization in the financial sector. 
But sadly, that is not enough. Realizing about that open source matters and starting to interact with open source, it's pretty normal nowadays. Um, and if your organization wants to start the journey to become an open source first organization, you can take the long way, the long path, um, starting to do open source ad hoc. That is, okay, um, there is a vulnerability here. How can we fix it? Let's talk with this team. Okay, let's start to do open source as, as the issue starts and the, as the issue happens. Or uh, you can put a strategy. You can have a dedicated team or a matrix of experts uh, that acts as a centralized place as this, so they can guide better and you can accelerate uh, this journey. Because as I said, adopting a strategic posture around open source is no longer optional right now. And that is what an OSPO is, actually. Some organizations uh, started to put a strategy on top of all the open source efforts uh, to accelerate this open source adoption and accelerate this innovation. So it's, uh, the short answer is uh, OSPOs are more like a designated place that is uh, where you put all the open source operations and efforts. And um, to visualize better this idea, I also like to share this graph where it's like, okay, where to an OSPO? When, when, when is the time to start an OSPO? Well, if your organization is starting to think about, let's have open source policies. Let's have an open source strategy. Let's build a matrix of expert. Then is when you should be thinking about an OSPO. Uh, if, for in, if your organization, on the other hand, is uh, doing open source ad hoc, there are not coordinated efforts, there is lack of alignment within the organization, or even the top level management uh, doesn't really understand the value of open source. Like, yeah, they know open source is there, but they don't really get it. Um, stay, just um, wait and uh, keep building this awareness. And once the organization realizes that they really need strategy and policies, and they start to take care of uh, the strategy, it's when an OSPO uh, might be a good op opportunity to, to have. Um, so also to explain better and to uh, define better uh, what is an OSPO, here are some characteristics that can define an OSPO I think can help you understand better. Uh, so, if your organization has an OSPO, it's very likely that your employees are tasked with fostering and nurturing open source usage. Uh, you have already employees that are contributing uh, code to open source. There are processes, procedures, and tools uh, to facilitate this open source consumption. Um, and as I said, the decision makers already recognize that open source software it's uh, important for uh, the um, innovation of the organization's products or services. Um, here are some of the characteristics that an OSPO can have. And I highlight an OSPO can have because there are OSPOs that only focus on two, three responsibilities. There will be OSPOs that are only focused more on the legal side, on, for instance, um, uh, oversee open source compliance uh, or uh, working on the inner source side, but there will be others that tries to gather all the different responsibilities. So this is just an example. So in a nutshell, uh, starting an open source program office means uh, moving from open source ad hoc to adopting a strategic posture on open source infusing the whole organization with a clear understanding of open source. So what is this? Um, communication, because that is sometimes a really important topic that maybe 
your organization, you have a team involving open source, but it's not aligned with the organization's goals, and then it's for nothing because you keep building your goals and the organization have another different goals and you're stuck. So it's a way to also build this matrix of experts around different teams that can communicate, that can speak the language of those teams and thus everyone is aligned. Everyone knows the benefits of open source and how to be involved in open source. And finally, it's also a way to accelerate open source adoption and thus innovation. Um, but let's go beyond that. Um, I will also uh, talk about a way where people can better frame OSPOS, because OSPOS has a journey. Like there are OSPOs that are just starting and there are really seasoned OSPOs that has been there for almost a decade, uh, and uh, they have been advancing. So in, in Sudo, uh, we work together into a maturity model that works as a framework to understand the different maturity stages uh, that an OSPO can go through. And I really want to serve briefly all these different stages. And maybe if your organization has an OSPO right now, or you're thinking about having an OSPO, you can try to map um, where it is in, in this, in this um, model. Uh, so this model is composed, uh, composed by uh, four different stages. The first one is the legal driven. Uh, you need to take care of the inventory, you need to first assess that, then community-driven, engagement-driven, and leadership-driven. And all this depends on the ability, the OSPO level will depend on the ability to execute. During the first stage, the legal-driven stage, as I said, um, the organizations are trying to identify all the legal and security risk. So it's about careful licensing, developer education, inventory taken. Once the organization has all that in place and they know which project, they have a list of projects like these projects are green light, these projects are red light, okay, let's, let's go. It's when uh, they can start building this community driven stage and start building ambassadors to build this open source education within the organization and try develop, train developers to contribute to open source. And also amplify the message. Uh, and once that education is somehow adopted, we can move to a, commun a more mature community driven state where um, the employees can actually take actions, take have uh, quality contributions to open source, um, and they can begin to streamline and optimize open source bound contributions for the developers, and even launch open source projects. Uh, when you are more mature, when the organization is more mature in the OSPO, they can move to engagement driven state, so they are actually taking action. Um, so it's when uh, they can support uh, incubating and launching open source projects, um, and it's the time when the OSPO is developing playbooks, processes, checklists to um, help them, help the organization uh, being, start being open source first citizens. And finally, the leadership driven states. Here is when the OSPO can become this advisor uh, for the CDO and uh, they have the knowledge and the means to um, benchmark what constitute a good and acceptable open source project based on where do they want you to go and the technology stacks. And um, you might be thinking, okay, this is great, but maybe it's too advanced for, for financial systems and financial services. Uh, so that's why I also wanted to share some examples of real organizations in these sectors 
that actually has an OSPO, and not only they just started, but they have been there for decades, some of them. <laughs> so the first two examples, uh, Bloomberg and Capital One, for instance, uh, they've been, like, Bloomberg was one of the first uh, organizations that joined to do uh, some years ago, and now they are, they, they can call themselves open source first company. They have been doing great efforts to the open source community. They know how to get involved in open source. And then Capital One, they started the open source program office more than five years ago. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Goldman Sachs. I think they, they have been engaging in open source a long time, but they started the OSPO last year. And since last year, uh, the, the journey they have been taking has been tremendous. They have been engaging in Twitter as well, so I've been able to follow the, the work really closely. And they also even created a web page uh, for the OSPO where they said, like, these are all the open source projects we are contributing. These are the open source projects we are releasing, our mission, our vision. I, I think um, in the in Open Source Summit, uh, they talk about the journey of Goldman Sachs in the OSPO. Really recommend you to, to take a look if you haven't done so. And also um, wanted to highlight all the OSPOs that are being formed, Fannie Mae, for instance, and more that uh, are yet to come, that they haven't served that publicity, but eventually they will do. So um, there are, this is a movement that is happening also in the financial systems. And this is not just uh, organizations in the early states, OSPO, um, but also organizations that are quite seasoned. Um, so to end up with, uh, I would like to open a discussion here, because I think the main goal of, of this talk is to, 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 to discuss about these topics uh, on ways how can we work together uh, across communities uh, to increase OSP adoption within uh, financial services. So here are my three questions. The first one, how can more OSPOers uh, help out financial services firms? I mean, how can other OSPOs from other sectors share their knowledge, and can do those knowledge be an inspiration for OSPOs that are being formed in the financial services? Also, uh, how can OSPOs in financial services, the existing ones, collaborate with other OSPOs to build and contribute to common tooling and infrastructure? Um, and finally, how can we infuse OSPO learnings into a Finos readiness program that is focused on help um, financial services to uh, adopt open source uh, and, and build this strategy and politics uh, across open source uh, and, and have its adoption in finance and banking sector? Um, just two more slides and then we can go through this open discussion. A uh, short story about Tudu, because I've been talking about Tudu, but I haven't explained what is Tudu. It's also a Linux Foundation um, project. It's an OSPO network in a space, but we also create resources. And the good thing is, of this is that it's uh, the community builds it. So it's, uh, it's formed by OSPO participants and OSPO leaders worldwide and across different sectors and divisions. Of, in fact, Goldman Sachs is there, Capital One is there, Bloomberg is there. So there are also OSPOs in finance um, working on these resources. And, and we do this OSPO guidance and support through network spaces, education, training, research, and tooling. And this is me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter or connect with me on, on LinkedIn, happy to do so. And, and thank you so much. And we can move now to questions and then to the open discussion. Thank you. OK, so are there any questions? Or we can maybe uh, try to bring this discussion on uh, how can we, Finos and 
uh, Tudu can collaborate uh, to, to help this OSP adoption in the financial system. Yeah, yes? Uh, you mentioned the OSP uh, developed tooling. Can you give me some examples? Of tooling. So uh, right now we have the, um, how is it called? Repolinter that um, I'm not in the in the in the project itself, but as far as I know, it's a way to scan, look for issues on every single repository. Uh, I don't have a lot of details on that because, as I as I said, I don't contribute to that. But if you go to To Do Group uh, GitHub organization, you will see all the you can read the readme file and see uh, the tooling for, for that is focused. I know like a lot of OSPOS uses it. And I think Chris is there, and he contributes to that, so maybe he can say more details about the project. Also, landscape is going to help us do better with that. It's out of course. Yep. I'm just curious, what would be your call to action? You don't necessarily have the CTO to take thanks to it, but what would be your... Just start an OSPO? Yeah. What would you, what would you say so first, I will say uh, under. I'm gonna go here because I think this is key. Uh, first, ask. Uh, try to see where is your organization in the open source journey. So, are you are you working on a strategy and policies? Is the top level management uh, aware of this or not? Uh, if if they are willing to start these uh, policies and a strategy around open source, then uh, start thinking about building this matrix of experts. Like, where are the right people across teams that can start collaborating in, in this open source and act as the center of, um, of the open source operations? And well, and of course, um, many OSPOs, what I, they have started with was uh, doing the, in the legal driven states. So starting with everything related with taking software inventory, building the list and uh, covering all the ri uh, risk um, and licensing things and uh, yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah. I think just following up, sorry, on what you just said, because some of the other examples, not as good as some of the other ones that people are, but a different state in Germany. I think what would be good is some kind of, of an open source regulatory and legal framework that they have adapted for open source, which others can use, uh, and make that journey much more seamless. In order to 
to consume open source, you have to have the policy and everything already in place because you're taking code now from the outside and bringing that into your organization. So I guess the question for me is, how do you convince management to put through the effort, to go through all the effort of putting the policies and stuff together so that you can actually consume to demonstrate the value? So I guess that was the question that I had. If you have any thoughts, anybody has any thoughts on that? I mean, I think there are many ways to do that and um I can give some suggestions, but these are not like rules uh, at all. Um, I think if uh, engaging with communities, like uh, like for instance, in Todo, one of the feedback they they I usually heard is that I can talk with other people that have same issues as me, and for instance, convinces the top level management of building um, policies around, it's one of them. And I can get some inspiration of what others did in the past and apply them. So uh, if you have time to go to these networking spaces, I think it really helps. Um, there are also some articles from uh, people that had an OSPO, started an OSPO, and actually it's like how to convince your manager to start an OSPO. Uh, one of them is in the Tudor blog, but one of the Tudor members, uh, Ivan. So really recommend to at least take a look. Maybe you can find something interesting there. Yep. Good point. Yep. So, you can also try to create a study how many uh, developer hours it would take to implement a feature and build it from scratch internally versus how many developer hours it would take to create a process for the intake of that industry. So, so the costing and chasm problem, you need to de-risk your leadership from making a mess of it by creating these quick and fast ways of doing things to the point where they know they were there. I think Finos was there, I think it's the financial compliance uh, infrastructure thing. It's all about the great faith of anyone who's a, a large bank to go to see where there is value in, in this kind of community. So for those who don't know that, that's to do with how we spin up about the construction regulatory compliance, um, which is a common problem to solve. So there are plenty of opportunities to demonstrate the value of this thing. I think leadership is going to be risk in making this mess of it by being shown the way. I think just to add something on that, I think like um, doing from bottom to top to top down, I mean, both approaches needs to be done in, in this, like not only top to bottom, but on also the other way as well. All right, so um, 
If there are no any other questions, um, thank you so much. And if you want to chat or um, catch up, uh, I'll be happy to do so uh, in the break room, in the hallway. Thank you so much.